Hello and welcome back, or maybe I should welcome myself back. It's been a while since I've been able to make some content for you guys, and I'm pretty stoked to have things organized to where that can be done now. Uh, I'm also back taking the show on the road and doing uh, live lectures and things. So if you or an agency you know is interested in having live lecture or continuing education or cardiology review or new new learning, uh, you can always email me at shadetreecardiology at gmail.com. And I can send you all my credentials and things like that in the places I'm accredited and we can get a conversation started. Today, I want to talk about what's going to be at least a three-part series called Understanding 12 Leads. So we still have a huge amount of errors that are made, particularly in the pre-hospital setting. And then with the the aftermath of COVID in very many people comes coagulopathy. And I've, I've seen quite a, quite a bit of an uptick in the, uh, the levels of STEMIs and things that we've seen. So I want to talk a little bit about this at a, at a little bit of a higher level, not a technical level, but a higher level. Let me explain what I mean. The first thing we have to start with is the geography. So if you don't already know which leads correspond to what anatomy of the heart, you really want to, to get that crammed in. And then once you've done that, you want to begin to understand exactly which coronary artery perfuses that geography, that section of the heart, that anatomy. This is really going to help you understand the pathophysiology of that acute onset MI. So there are three main coronary arteries we're going to discuss today. They come off of two ostea, which come off the side of the aorta. One of them goes directly and becomes the right coronary artery. The other branches into this transparent vessel you see, it's called the left main coronary artery, which will then split into the left anterior descending artery and the left circumflex. In a small portion of the population, there's one that comes out in between these two for a short distance called the ramus intermedius. Now, you won't ever be able to tell that directly from an EKG, not, not that I'm aware, but it is a fun fact. It's a fun thing to know. All right, so let's talk about what an ST segment elevated uh, MI looks like really quickly. So you can see the ST segment is elevated here, so it doesn't go back down to baseline and then become a T wave. It's as if you build a bridge between the QRS complex and the T wave. And you guys should know that by now. It's just quick review. So here's the issue with that. The ST segment elevation shows a problem with electricity. We're not able to make it. We're not able to exchange it. Now that electricity comes from the electrolytes, which is in blood plasma. If we're not making blood plasma get to the places it needs to go, it's obstructed. Why is it obstructed? Well, that's the question. That's the question that we, we get the answer to at the PCI facility. But often enough, with sudden onsets of chest pain, we're talking about a clot or what people love to call a heart attack, right? This is a transmural MI when this happens. So when it's one of these three main vessels, let's go back to that slide. When it's one of these three main vessels, these produce ischemia spanning the full thickness of the myocardium. And this is why they need a PCI facility, because if you kind of think about it, these are the vessels that are big enough to put a stent in, okay? So they can cat these vessels. They're large enough. And if we do that within 90 minutes, we get minimal damage. Now let's talk about, there's going to be three main types of STEMIs, right? Because there's three main coronary arteries. Let's talk about the inferior MI, okay? Probably the one you're most likely to see. It's, it's very common. When you see an inferior wall MI, it can be any of these three vessels, technically, because all three do terminate in the inferior wall. However, the greatest percentage of the inferior MIs are right coronary artery blockages. And the RCA is of particular importance because it perfuses the entirety of the conduction system. And I've got a picture of that here in a slide to come. So this is why we see conduction disturbances. We see bradycardia very often. In the inferior STEMI, we see, you know, our first degree blocks and our second degree type one and two and so on and so forth. Okay. We see blood begin to back up into the venous circuit. We can see JVD. Okay. We can see pulmonary edema. We can see a lot of that. Uh, the right side involvement they talk about so much is referring to right ventricular involvement. And of course it makes perfect sense as to why blood would back up in the pulmonary circuit and would back up into the venous circuit if the right ventricle is unable to empty. All right. For this reason, the nitrates that we like to use so much are often contraindicated. Now, it depends on where you work and what the standard of care is in, in your country where you're watching this. Um, but the current standard of care in most of the developed countries is we do still use nitrates. We either use them very conservatively um, 
or, you know, intravenous and instead of using massive amounts, you know, sublingually. But anytime we do, especially with this, we always have IV access. And in this particular case, we have large bore IV access, often bilaterally. Now, just for reference, an 18 gauge IV is not a large bore IV. We're talking about 14s and 16s if the vasculature will allow for it. Why is that? Because you can give a liter of fluid in just over three minutes with a 14 gauge IV. So if you have a patient with compromised preload and you administer nitrates, which will hurt that preload, you can compensate for that while the arterial walls open up and begin to, for lack of a better analogy, sneak blood past that clot and allow that part of the heart to reperfuse, even on a micro level, to keep it alive and allow the patient to compensate until they're with the interventional cardiologist actually getting PCI. So let's have a look at that geography again with a new photo put up here. So if you watch my cursor, I'm hovering over the right coronary artery here, and you can see how that corresponds to the conduction system. It makes perfect sense as to why, given all of this location, we would see conduction system disturbances. All right, so let's take a look at an actual EKG. Now, this, this could go in a textbook, uh, and this is there's a reason I started with it. Let's delve into it. So let's look at leads 2, 3, and AVF to begin with. There's plenty of ST uh, elevation there. It's not anything we have to be concerned about, uh, you know, whether or not it actually is a transmural MI. It most certainly is, okay? We see reciprocal depression in 1 and AVL. So it hits the benchmarks that we need, right, to, to get the cath lab on standby. This one also, they've taken the precordial leads and placed them on the right-hand side to take a look at some things. And as you can see here, V4R being the most popular uh, in terms of the literature and, and what's used to diagnose, we can see that the right ventricle is infarcted. Let's go back to that anatomy. You can imagine if you were to follow my cursor here, and place leads V3, V4, V5, and V6 around that side of the patient, they would be looking directly at this part of the heart. They would be monitoring the electricity directly in it. And if it produces ST segment elevation, then we can safely say those potassium channels are malfunctioning. And if that's the case, we can infer that there is a massive blockage and the right ventricle is likely infarcted. So, with right ventricular involvement, the patient is preload dependent. Let's, let's get into that a little bit deeper because people either didn't learn what preload was or, or they've often enough forgotten it because we don't use it all the time. In simple, in the simplest of terms, preload refers to the amount of stretch that happens during diastole. And you guys should remember Starling's law. The more you stretch the myocardium, the better the contraction, right? Well, what happens when that part of the heart is ischemic and it cannot contract fully and the right ventricle cannot empty? If we can't make it contract any harder, um, we can fill it up a little more before each contraction. Hopefully that, that makes sense. This is analogous to when your hand goes numb or your arm goes numb and you don't have much grip you know, while you're waiting for the feeling to come back. This muscle cannot contract because it's ischemic. So this patient's only means of compensation may very well be what stretch they have in the myocardium you know, with with the right ventricle emptying, let's say 50%. It's just the arbitrary number. But if only half of the ventricle is emptying, then they're only getting about half the blood flow to the rest of their body that they need. Can that sustain life? No. Will the blood pressure be low? Absolutely. What happens when we give a nitrate? Nitrates drop preload. Okay. So now we have interfered with the patient's only compensatory mechanism by using nitrates. So can we use nitrates all by themselves in the case of this type of MI? Absolutely not. And this is why so many places still to this day operate with the axiom of no nitrates in the inferior wall MI, which is not a good idea. Follow your standard of care, of course. But if you'll get into the research, uh, you know, we've known this for a very long time that nitrates can be safely used, but there has to be some compensation that usually comes in the form of fluid. So we're talking about fluid loading this patient at this point. We're talking about large bore IVs. An 18 gauge is not a large bore IV. A 14 gauge, if the patient's vasculature will allow for it, is the best choice because it can administer a liter of fluid in just over three minutes. So you can kind of imagine if you had bilateral 14 gauges in a patient and you needed to raise their blood pressure suddenly, that you'd be able to accomplish that very well with simple crystalloids like normal saline. So just kind of keep that in mind if you elect to use nitrates in these types of MIs.
Now, this is, again, just a picture of that geography. And I've just put a circle here to kind of give you a mental image of the area of infarct, the possible area of infarct. Okay, certainly the right ventricle would be involved in this picture. Let's have a look at another EKG. So th these will all be inferior wall MIs. So we can see 2, 3, AVF. They have the ST segment elevation we would be looking for. We can see one in AVL. It's got that reciprocal depression. There's some fun stuff going on in V2 over here. If you're not familiar with what that is, uh, this is a right coronary artery dominant patient. So let's go back to the anatomy picture. If you'll follow my cursor wrapping around the right coronary artery, this patient's RCA wraps around the back side of their heart and perfuses more than the left circumflex does coming around on this side. It's common for patients to have either an LCX or an RCA be dominant on the posterior side of the heart. You can kind of get evidence of that in this EKG. Let's go back to it where we see ST segment depression in V2. Now, reciprocal depression is simply that ST elevation looked at from the opposite side, okay? So you can kind of imagine if we see that inferior MI here, this is where it leads 2, 3, and AVF um, sort of produce their picture from. And I, I know that's not exact according to Eindhoven's triangle, but let's bend it a little bit. Work with me here. And you can kind of imagine how these high laterals produce that reciprocal depression in leads 1 and AVL. And then the inverse is true, which you can even see on this example EKG, leads 1 and AVL have ST segment elevation. So, of course, there's reciprocal depression. Because if you put the ST segment elevation here, you're looking at reciprocal depression down here. Now, I know that's a generalization, but stick with me because the analogy goes further. You can kind of imagine if you were looking at this heart from here and there was no infarct here at the left anterior descending artery, right? But there was infarct on the posterior wall, then all you would be able to see would be reciprocal depression, from here in the same way that when you see an anterior MI, right, in V1, V2, V3, say, with ST segment elevation, there is no reciprocal depression because you don't have any leads on the back side of the heart. If you were to throw them there, you'd have reciprocal depression if you ran a posterior EKG. And if you ran a posterior EKG on the patient in this EKG, you would have ST segment elevation in V2. So hopefully that makes sense. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of other little rules. It's not arbitrary, but as a generalization to kind of explain the concept, it really does work, okay? When you get into the nuts and bolts of it, a little bit changes, but it takes a while to get there. Let's have a look at another one here. So again, it's an inferior wall MI. These will only be inferior walls, and even though they're all inferior STEMIs, no two of these has looked identical, have they? So that's the reason I put them in here. So two, three, AVF, they have reciprocal depression. We do have, or excuse me, they have ST segment elevation. They do have reciprocal depression in AVL, but this patient doesn't have any in lead one. Is it necessary to have it in both one and AVL? Absolutely not. Is it necessary to have reciprocal depression at all? Absolutely not. Because remember, you can have an inferior wall MI from any of the three main coronary arteries as they all terminate to some extent in the inferior wall okay so you can see an LAD produce an inferior wall MI and when you see that you will see zero reciprocal depression so it's just something to keep in mind you're just trying to kind of determine the geography however the main takeaway here is most of the time elevation in two three and AVF are a product of a right coronary artery blockage and if you take that a step further, as we all should, and anticipate that problem that the right coronary artery blockage can cause, then we anticipate bradycardia. We have out the chemical agents that we would use to treat that. We have the pacing uh, apparatus not far from us, right? We have all of these things, and we're, we're able to kind of predict what the patient will do, or at the minimum, predict worst case scenario. And that's what the goal is. All right, guys, if you have some questions, feel free to drop them in the comments. If it's a question you don't want to ask publicly, by all means, you can send it to shadetreecardiology at gmail.com, and I'll give you an answer with some sources. Um, I understand. I look at this kind of like a virtual classroom. Not everybody wants to ask a question where everybody can see it. I get it. I 100% get that. You do not have to ask a, a question publicly. But if you want to, that's fine with me. Those comments do bump up the algorithm and make sure that more people who are – 
interested in the medical field, get to see more of this content, which is what I always wanted. Um, but again, don't, don't feel obligated to throw it in there. If it's something you want to ask privately, I'll answer you just as well as I would if it were in the comments. Uh, again, if anyone's interested in lectures, the same email address I just gave you, you can contact me there. And if there's anything I can do for you guys, let me know. Now get out there and practice.